Usually the first level or area in a game is the easiest. It's trying to teach you how to play, it's trying to give you the mechanics of the game, but that's not always how it works. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, the 10 toughest opening levels in video games, part two. So, like I said, this is part two. We've already done one of these, and I think that the first video is pretty good. If you're interested, we touched on Little Nightmares, Neo, Near Automata, Devil May Cry 3, Spelunky 2, Out of This World, The Witcher 2, Ninja Gaiden Black, Ghosts and Goblins, all the From Software games, and of course, Driver 1. So let's get going with round two, starting off at number 10. This is a nice recent one, Resident Evil Village. Now it takes a little while to get there, but the opening the eighth mainline entry in Resident Evil, uh, it pulls no punches. Once you actually get to the titular village, things kick off real quick. There's a brutal gauntlet of enemies that attack you from just every direction. And at this point, you've only fought one enemy. Suddenly the game is just gonna throw everything it's got at you. It's a, a real wake up call that seems like it's supposed to be impossible and actually it is. It triggers a cutscene that ends the whole siege. And it takes an excruciatingly long period of time, usually well after running out of healing supplies and ammo. On normal, this part's tough, but on harder difficulties, this is easily the hardest part to get through. Nothing else even comes remotely close to it. Resident Evil 4 was the first game to start out with a siege moment, and that whole segment's pretty infamous in its own right. Resident Evil 5 does the same thing, only this time it was worse if you're playing solo, because you have to worry about your AI partner too. That makes that starting buddy more frustrating. Resident Evil games just love to start off with a challenge, and Village, it may be the toughest yet, and perhaps one of the most interesting too. And number nine was Resistance 1. You ever remember the opening to this game? This isn't exactly the most famous of the PlayStation exclusives, but it's a pretty fun series with some cool weapons. Even if in the first game it takes a little while to get them. While the first game looks a lot like your standard Call of Duty style FPS, it's actually a bit of a more old school game. It's got a full weapon wheel and health pickups. Uh, the health system in the game is actually pretty great. You have a regenerating health meter you can recover to certain thresholds, so you're not completely screwed. It's it sounds probably like a lot of unnecessary explanation, but here's the thing. On the first level, you don't get that. You can't heal, like at all. I remember playing this game and feeling like I was doing something wrong or that the game bugged out or something because I would keep taking damage in this opening part and there were no health packs and you didn't regenerate. So it's like, what's going on? Turns out I just suck. But <laughs> even with the relatively easy enemies at the start, they could shred your health to nearly nothing. So having no way to recover really sucked. Uh, of course, it's only like that in the opening part of the first level, thankfully. Uh, it's not even for the entire level, but it does stick out as strange for first time players. It feels wrong and it's a pretty weird way to start the game. Still end of the day, pretty short segment. If you force your way through it, the rest of the game is relatively smooth sailing. I, it's hard, but it seems a lot more fair after that beginning. At number eight is Star Wars Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast. Uh, this is a great game, but the opening level does not do it any favors. Like it's set in this ugly gray Imperial base with the wimpiest of pistols ever in an FPS, a blaster that can't shoot straight. You deal with this army of stormtroopers who all I guess went to marksmanship school, unlike the entire rest of the stormtrooper army. Like these guys are crack shots and you can't hit the broadside of a barn. You'd think that this game would start you out with the lightsaber be called Jedi Knight 2 and all, but no, you gotta slog through multiple levels without it, all while dealing with a deficit of healing and ammo just to really drive home how useless you are without your precious laser sword. The first level, again, slog, plain and simple. Even on normal, it's rough, and you can quick save and quick load like a madman, hoping you get some lucky hits with the terrible blaster. <laughs> The game doesn't get a lot easier, but it gets a lot more fun once you finally get the lightsaber and your force powers back. And number seven is The Evil Within. First hour or so, this game is just relentless. It's total chaos. Starts off with this tense sneaking section where you have to get past this insane butcher, uh, this trap-filled hallway you have to run through, and then you actually properly start the game, which drops you into this relatively open rural village environment filled with enemies, and you don't really have any ammo or supplies. At this point in the game, you're basically useless too. You're slow, you barely have any health, and the revolver is awkward and slow to use. It's like 
like if Resident Evil 4 opened the same way, but now you have almost no ammo at all, and you have to figure out how stealth works at the same time. It's completely overwhelming, and you pretty much always die a few times just trying to figure this game out. There's not really a whole lot to this. It's just a really tough segment. It gives you almost nothing, and you can't use anything to your advantage, really. So you have to rely on these basic, yet pretty unforgiving stealth mechanics. If you have the fortitude to make it through the opening of Evil Within, the rest of the game really shouldn't be that big of a problem. And number six is Deus Ex. The original one really wanted to give players an RPG experience and an FPS. Uh, when you start off weak and become a walking death machine by the end of the game, you know, that type of thing. In most RPGs, you start off like fighting rats, not a terrorist army, you know, one that's taken over the Statue of Liberty. Uh, that, that's what you do, though. And at the start of the game, you're almost completely useless. Aiming takes forever. You're slow. Enemies can spot you a mile away. And only a couple of shots will kill you. The only weapons you start off with is a shock baton, only effective at close range. Takes a couple hits to even knock a single enemy out. And a tranquilizer crossbow that requires a headshot to take an enemy out. Oh, and boy, does that thing take, just take an absolute eternity to aim. Uh, but at least it is quiet and a pistol, which can kill guys well enough, I guess. But if you fire it, then every enemy in the area comes running. Uh, it's a brutal enemy that scared away a lot of potential players. Getting through the first level was the biggest hurdle into getting into this game. But once you do, it's kind of a smooth ride, you know? What makes Deus Ex unique is how the developers almost went all overboard with how weak you are at the start. Like, it can't be overstated just how slow you aim starting out. It is painful. Like, watching somebody aim in this game is like, ah, go faster, do it faster. But you can't. You can't do it faster. Once you get some experience points to better equipment. The game gets way more fun, though. And number five is Pokemon Yellow. I know most people are pretty used to thinking that the Pokemon games are pretty easy, especially at the start, but uh, Yellow's not. It was released after Red and Blue to capitalize on the popularity of the Pokemon anime and Pikachu in general, and the game's pretty much identical to Red and Blue except for one crucial thing. You do not pick a starter, you start with Pikachu, which is not really a problem for Route 1 and the opening of the game, but it's a big problem against the first gym leader, Brock. Brock is a rock-type trainer, which rhymes with his name and makes perfect sense and uh rock type pokemon completely or at least mostly immune to all of pikachu's attack don't know why perhaps it was for the heck of it for fun just to see how everybody dealt with it but the most popular pokemon is completely useless against the first boss in the game that was what they decided to release so your only option was to capture a different pokemon train him up to fight brock uh, which turns the opening hours of this game a lot more tedious than in red and blue like in red and blue if you pick charmander at the start you would would run into the same problem facing Brock, but none of the Charmander attacks are straight up useless against Brock's Pokemon. They're just weak. So for whatever reason, they decided to make Pikachu the objectively worst Pokemon starter in maybe the entire series, just because they didn't change who the starting trainer was. Like you could have just made it Misty and it saved everyone a lot of pain, but they didn't. And number four, Sonic 2. And I am not talking about Sonic the Hedgehog 2 for Sega Genesis. No, we're talking about Game Gear Sonic 2. Like, for anybody who had the misfortune of having a Game Gear as a kid and didn't just plug the damn thing in, you know the problem. That was the problem I lived with. Thing ate through batteries like crazy, and, well, let's go on with this Sonic 2 thing. Like, most Sonic games are pretty forgiving. All things considered, they're very reflex-based, but they're okay about it. They let you make mistakes and not hate yourself over it. Uh, but for whatever reason, Sonic 2 on Game Gear, it wants you dead. The first level is brutal. Like, there's deadly spikes, there's Hail Mary jumps all over the place, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. And that's just the first level. Like, compare this to the first level of any other Sonic game. Uh, usually it's a Green Hill Zone knockoff, it's got some nice music, bright color palette, but in this game, you start off in Underground Zone with minecarts and lava. Lava! The boss is one of the worst encounters in the entire franchise, too. It's a ant, lion, robot thing, and the only way to hurt it is to avoid the these bombs, which sounds simple, but uh, Game Gear Sonic didn't have the best controls in the world. That goes for any of the Game Gear Sonics. When I was a kid, I could not beat this level. The first level in the Sonic game, which is supposed to be easy and like ease you into the controls and stuff, but no! And the pain doesn't stop. The game doesn't get easier. And it's bad enough going to play this game on like modern hardware through emulation where you can see everything better. But imagine this on Game Gear's crappy screen, terrible battery life, and frankly not great form figure. This game was rough. 
At number three is Fallout 2. The Temple of Trials in Fallout 2 isn't really a first level, it's a tutorial, but uh, unless you're experienced with the first game and built your character a specific way to get through its challenges, this unskippable dungeon can actually be the hardest part of the game. So Fallout's pretty free form, right? You can build your character a lot of different ways and then you start the game. You get sent to this temple, which gives you a spear as a weapon, that's it. And if you only put points into ranged weapons in terms of how you created your character, you are already in trouble. To make matters worse, the only healing items that you get are these healing powders, which lower your perception when you use it. Uh, so that makes it so enemies are harder to hit. See how that might be a problem? Like, yeah, all you're fighting are rats and scorpions, but if you can't even hit things, they'll eventually whittle your health down. It's embarrassing and frustrating when you stand there taking random swings at normally harmless enemies and, uh, you know, losing. It's not just embarrassing, it's demoralizing. The game expects you to use your skills without really explaining how they work, which is an interesting approach for a tutorial. Tutorial. Um, if you're a Fallout veteran, you probably know this stuff already, but if you're not, well, it's confusing. Apparently, the creators of the game weren't originally going to even include a tutorial, but they got forced to include one at the last minute, so it probably explains why the whole segment's very half-assed feeling, uh, because they didn't have to make it mandatory. The Temple of Trials is the low point of the game. It's not just dull, but it's also very frustrating. At number two is Elder Scrolls Arena, the first game in the Elder Scrolls series. It, it feels archaic this, these days, but it was actually very ahead of its time. And a lot of people have not made it past the Imperial Dungeon, though, probably for good reason. Uh, like every other Elder Scrolls game, you start off as a prisoner. Your starting goal is simple, escape the dungeon, which seems like it would be a simple tutorial level. Maybe walk you through the controls, tell you how the game works. Uh, that's how it'll be in later games, Morrowind, Oblivion, etc. Uh, but not here. Instead, you're basically thrown to the wolves. Like, you you needed to read the instruction manual because otherwise you don't know what to do, period. To call the controls awkward would be a massive understatement. Right from the get-go, you're disoriented and confused. You're just doing basic actions and that even takes a lot of getting used to. So while you're grappling with the controls, you're swarmed with deadly rats who will mess you up fast depending on your class. If you're a wizard, expect to run out of magic no matter what and there's no way to recover it. In fact, there are actually only a few ways to recover health at all and to make things even more fun, enemies respawn. It's an all-around cruel introduction that makes you know what's in store for you when you play this game, which is, to be very clear, pain. And at number one is Superman, the new Superman Adventures, also known as Superman 64. Bad title, frankly, but, uh, you know, a lot of people can get past that. The idea of a Superman game sounds great. So, do you like flying through rings? Weird question to ask, but uh, how about baffling objectives that only give you seconds to respond in time? How about some of the jankiest controls ever devised for an action game? No, you don't want these things. Nobody wants these things. And this game, oh, it's built on these things. They are thrown together slapdash and create one of the most frustrating and terrible opening sequences to any game ever period it starts off really bad right from the start the first thing the game wants you to do is fly through all these rings just an endless string of rings in this pea soup colored void that's supposed to be metropolis the controls are of course terrible but this section is also relatively easy i guess you finish the rings part and i, I guess the game it's difficult to describe this but um it, it wants you to um yeah this I, I don't know what's going on. And I lost and uh, have to do the ring part again. That's fun. Oh, wait, except it's not fun. Most people just turn this game off and chuck the game back in the blockbuster video clamshell where it belongs. And instead of using their drawer, you heave it through their window. How dare you keep this on your shelf? And you know what? Yeah, let's say you try to muddle through this part. The game doesn't get any better. It's just more of these rings, more baffling objectives, and needlessly strict time limits. This is a game that might actually be worse than its reputation implies, which is a hell of an achievement because no one likes this game. It is considered one of the worst games ever made. Like, look at this. This is the first level, the part the developers presumably put the most effort into hooking the player in, and this was the best they could do. Ouch. Also got a quick bonus for you. You remember the Super Star Wars series? Uh, if you're as old as me, you do. Uh, they were great. I'm not saying that they weren't great, but I also don't know if anyone played these things legitimately because they were crazy hard. The first two especially, for some reason, everything on Tatooine wants Luke Skywalker dead. Like, everything is an enemy and just starts attacking you from every angle. Like, yeah, Moss Eisley is a dangerous area filled with scum and villainy, but walking around in an empty desert shouldn't be this difficult. Like, you're just going to the Sandcrawler to have a look at some droids. You're going shopping. The first level of Super Empire Strikes Back is somehow actually worse than Super Star Wars. You know Hoth is supposed to be a, like, super barren ice planet with nothing on it? Yeah. 
That's not the truth. Not in the game anyway. Just swarming with predators. Swarming! The game pulls no punches. It's one of the hardest games on the SNES, and the first levels are some of the toughest. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero. And we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.